Hello, everyone, and welcome to the number four spotlight on uh, November 11th. Uh, happy Veterans Day, everyone. Uh, today, we will be having Dr. Melinda Hall uh, presenting, who is our uh, Brown Faculty Fellow for Scholarship and Publication. Uh, the topic she will be presenting on is uh, Risking Ourselves, the Politics and Persons of Risk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hall, for being here. Thank you so much, and happy Veterans Day, Chris. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm very excited to present this work. Um, there have been some developments, let's say, <laughs> in the arena of risk and risk discussion began uh, my project. And one particular development about which you will be extremely familiar um, is the COVID pandemic. And obviously, this has um, become an issue for me in a deep sense for my work. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today um, and uh, sort of point toward some initial perspectives that I have on COVID and how I'm going to incorporate it into this project. So my project focuses on risk in what I hope is a new and interesting way. I'm interested in the distribution and attribution of responsibility for risk in uh, clinical contexts, in the context of emerging technology, in viral illness contexts. Um, initially, I became interested in this as a result of my um, tracking of travel bans that were called for in some circles during the Ebola virus disease outbreak in November of 2014. 2015. Um, and so I'm interested in the sorts of ethical issues that are presented by dominant understandings of risk. I'm in, so a lot of folks say that the biggest issue is risk communication. And when I initially started this project, I was interested in that too. Um, but there's a bit of a distraction here um, about uh, person and scientific communication in which the idea is something like, well, People just don't understand risk very well. Um, and I want to complicate that a bit. Um, my uh, work is always informed by um, French continental philosophy, um, including Michel Foucault. And I'm looking at discursive engagements, the way that we talk, um, and how those impact institutions and our understandings of ourselves. So one of my other concerns um, is with how individuals and populations are positioned as subjects at risk or risky subjects, um, as risk managers, venture capitalists even. There are all different sorts of ways that people see themselves in and through risk that I find fascinating and ripe for ethical analysis. Um, and in a certain sense, we're often asked to manage risk. Um, and this is obvious right now with COVID, right? Wear your mask and so on. Um, but you also see sort of like oddities in when people are being asked to manage risk. Um, Around the time that Zika uh, was initially a major concern, here in Elizabeth Hall, we had some posters up saying uh, about Zika, um, don't let your bitten uh, by mosquitoes. Um, and I thought that was so fascinating. Don't let yourself be bitten by mosquitoes. Um, I, here in Florida, we're bitten by mosquitoes all the time. And I was grappling with what it meant to ask people to manage a risk like Zika um, from a public health perspective, the perspective of engagement um, in bioethics and analyzing um, those public health moves. Um, and I apologize, let me close this um, so that I do not get another notification. So my larger, so my book project, I just started by wanting to explore a lot of these things. Um, and of course, then, as I already hinted, we have COVID coming up. So I first articulated, as I said, my concerns around risk um, around the time of the Ebola outbreak um, and the global response to that. And we had the construction of African uh, males, especially West African males, is inherently risky. Um, and I started to engage in that. And now, of course, anyone who's working on risk needs to engage COVID in a very serious way. And I do plan to do that. And I actually think my project is very copacetic with ways in which we can tackle COVID um, together. Um, and I'm very excited to chat a little bit about that as well. 
Um, so I'll just start by saying a little bit um, more specifically about how this book project works. I told you what my interests are um, in risk and how that fits a little bit with already existing literature. Um, that is engagement in the ways in which we're asked to take responsibility, engagement in the ways that um, we conceive ourselves in and through risk. Um, so here's where I'll share with you my claims. I do believe that risk presents a special set of issues with biomedicists, but I want to bring risk mitigation itself under new moral evaluation. So instead of simply tackling the question of how best to communicate risk and have people analyze and understand it well, um, some of those technocratic sorts of questions, I want to know how risk mitigation strategies can be morally evaluated. How is it that the way we do risk individually and together impacts people? Um, and I'm looking for all kinds of different implications and impacts, but one specifically related to violence, to mortality, um, to sickness and disease, and to disability. Um, I'm also very interested in the way that risk is linked to racism. Uh, sorry, ri risk is linked to racism. And so I'll mention um, a little bit about that in relation to police brutality. Um, so what I argue, uh, essentially, is that risk management discourses tend to marginalize those affected and sort of paradoxically increase the harms to which some are subject. I hesitate to say increase the risk to which some are subject, although that would be very um, sort of catchy. And the reason for that is that I think risk is very political. So I hesitate to sort of reinscribe what risk means by assuming that we understand, you know, oh, we're gonna increase risk that some people are subject to. So I use the language of increasing harms. So I believe this is partly because, and I argue this, Responsibility for risk is substantially assigned to and borne by individuals. And I'm using Foucault and his work in order to demonstrate those features of risk discourses. So I do claim in this book project that we need to have collective sharing of responsibility for risk. In order to understand that claim and to make that claim live and move and be dynamic, I have to explain or prove or demonstrate to my readers that risk needs to be read politically. Um, and so I do believe that risk is political sort of all the way down. Um, and I'm gonna attempt to demonstrate that in part today. Um, and I am going to claim that the language of risk needs to be interrupted to make space for possible collective responsibilities. So I like this idea of risking ourselves together through collective responsibility. Um, I'm pulling from Heidegger there. I'm pulling from disability theory um, about vulner vulnerability. Um, and I want um, to share with you a variety of ways in which this project has, has cashed out so far. Um, so I definitely will try to keep to time here um, and leave space for questions, um, absolutely. Uh, and I, so I'm gonna try to be, um, I'm gonna try to be concise, uh, but I do have a lot of different examples that I've been working with and I'm excited to share some of those. So I'll linger uh, when I can, if I can. Um, so thank you for, uh, you know, uh, sort of indulging me as risk is my favorite topic um, to talk about. Um, so what do what are some of the concerns that put me here? I've indicated this a little bit um, already. I think I'll just briefly um, have this slide. Up. Uh, in bioethics and public health, people talk about risk all the time. They talk about the way in which patients are sort of imbricated or um, subjectified as risk managers. So there's a lot of literature out there on genetic counseling. There's a lot of literature on the way that parents are asked to manage risks for their dependents. Um, and a lot of ways in which uh, we talk about risk management for advanced directives and things like that. So that's there. Um, and then uh, I also um, notice that these have implications because people begin to see themselves as responsible in ways uh, that are related to what bioethicists and public health discourses indicate are their responsibilities. For what is risk exactly? I think that 
most familiar with it in the guise of risk assessment. And in fact, in a lot of the literature that you'll find in sociology and in a lot of different disciplines and philosophy too, which is obviously my field, um, risk and risk assessment are used synonymously. So it's almost uh, a requirement that part of what you're doing when you talk about risk is you're engaging in predictive uh, discussions. Um, some philosophers have uh, talked about um, this in terms of insurance types of language. And the phrase that I glommed onto early on was actuarial thinking, um, where uh, you take for granted that when we talk about risk, what we're trying to do is engage in very good sort of actuarial thinking. Um, predictions about the future, assumptions, especially in bioethics about quality of life and so on. Um, and of course, we do risk assessments all the time. I mean, think about construction, information technology, definitely public health, property loss, damage. Um, also think about EPA uh, risk assessments. Um, those are done by NEPA. Um, and uh, Obasogi, a bioethicist, wants to sort of analogize this for racialized medicines um, to be sure that we assess properly the implications there. Um, and then you have large scale conflicts. You know, um, what's the risk that we're going to have a conflict? What's the risk that we're going to be invaded? What kind of um, vulnerability are we showing here on the global stage? So on. So you get uh, risk assessment discourses in a lot of places. Um, it's interesting that risk assessment is a technocratic concern because then you get people who are actually certified card carrying risk managers. Um, we have a risk management office here at Stetson. Um, Elise Paulson does risk management for Stetson. Um, in a lot of ways, our lawyers do risk management. Um, and what you get out of this, if you have a certification for this sort of idea or engagement in, um, in a variety of different um, uh, positions, working for a variety of different industries, um, what you get is the rise of um, emergent sort of objective risk measures and acceptable levels of risk, where you uh, get numerical um, in, uh, numerical uh, approximations, calculations. Um, and so uh, an example for theorization of risk in public health might be something like risk is multiplication of emissions, transport, loss factor, exposure period, uptake in toxicity. That's pretty interesting to me as a philosopher who cares about discourse, that you get emergent, really thick definitions of what counts as risk when they appear so many different places. So in sociology, which I dipped into during my sabbatical, uh, which is what this presentation is really about, is how I pushed forward my project across my sabbatical. Um, in part, uh, some of that was, you know, noticing new things. Um, I engaged in a lot of reading of sociology. And there you get emergent in the early 80s, this idea of a cultural theory of risk. Um, and people saying, hey, look, like, risk is an objective matter related to, like, measurable hazards necessarily. Um, different values that folks have give rise to different understandings of risk, and we have to be able to understand those cultural um, engagements to really do uh, risk assessment work. Um, so they early on challenged the idea that there's a scientist who knows risk quite well and then a lay person who needs to be taught because the lay person has their own concerns about risks and you can't assume that those are shared. Um, so you have a cluster of values. Um, in 2006, Kahan and co-authors said, look, you know, you could have egalitarian values, individualistic and hierarchical values. Risk interpretation is dependent on these. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that, and I work with that a little bit. And so what I would say initially, out of all of this sort of like landscape, is there are lots of alternative portraits of risk. Learning what risk is and who's responsible for it requires we can't skip over this, investigating all these different sites in which we tell stories about risk and become engaged in risk assessment. And my claim, and here I'm not necessarily going to argue strongly to try to persuade you on this. I might just have to assume it for now and then fill in the blanks later. But um, I am claiming that we shouldn't privilege the understanding of risk available in risk assessment sciences. So in the technocratic understanding, I do believe it's helpful and correct in the sense that indeed is one of the sites, the emergence of risk, but it is not, it shouldn't be privileged as the site of risk. I want to multiply discourses. I'm always interested in that, including in my 
work on disability, I'm always trying to multiply um, understandings instead of um, instead of coalesce around a trans uh, cultural, trans contextual uh, concept. So I'm going to talk, so when I say that there, okay, let me go back one moment. When I say that there are many alternative portraits of risk, that leads me to the desire to have a series of case studies, which is how I uh, sort of planned the book initially. And I think the, for the first half of the book, I'm going to stick with this. I've done, you know, some uh, discursive analysis in a philosophical way. I've tried to like really be thoughtful about this, and I don't want to lose that work and give over the whole book manuscript to COVID and viral illness. So viral illness was initially one of my case studies. I'm going to keep it that way for the first half of the book. So here's one of my case studies, police brutality. I was really struck and really desirous to understand how people get risk language out of police brutality um, after reading an excerpt from Darren Wilson's testimony regarding Michael Brown. Um, he was asked uh, when he um, uh, gave his affidavit, um, this is a, an excerpt from his affidavit, um, he was asked by, I believe it was a prosecutor or by a member of the prosecution team, um, whether or not Michael Brown was armed. And if you can read this, I know it's quite small, I just sort of like cut the part, a portion of this discussion. Um, the, uh, Darren Wilson said in response, uh, the prosecutor's team said, before drawing your weapon, Michael Brown had not displayed any weapon. And he was meant to affirm or deny. And he said, um, objection on the grounds that the term weapon is too vague, is vague, to the extent Michael Brown's body, including his fist, constitute weapons, this is denied. Similarly, uh, the question is with regard to threatening object, there's a little bit of a typo here, but he gave the same response um, for number 42, the question number 42, as he did for 41, just as he said about a weapon, um, he believes that Michael Brown's body constitutes a threatening object. Um, Feminist philosopher Sarah Ahmed uh, wrote in her fabulous 2017 monograph that there can be nothing more dangerous to a body than the social agreement that that body is dangerous. And I found that to be true across disability, across race, across all kinds of different areas. I really wanted to bring it into um, my ideas about risk. So here what I'm saying is that risk is attached directly to someone's body, their body that itself presents risk. That's what Darren Wilson is saying. Um, and George Zimmerman said something extremely similar about Trayvon Martin when folks complained, I mean, more than complained, rioted about the fact that um, Trayvon Martin was carrying Skittles and Sprite. Um, George Zimmerman said, we were on a sidewalk and he could have thrown me onto the sidewalk um, and used it to bash my head. So um, the fact that uh, this, this very young man, Trayvon Martin, was standing on a sidewalk meant that he was in a way armed for George Zimmerman. Um, so uh, direct-to-consumer testing is another area I'm super interested in for the construction of the idea of risk. Again, I'm investigating multiple sites to see what happens here. Um, and what you see in 23andMe.com, which is a billion dollar company um, valued that way because of its biobanking, not because it sells 29 to $100 kits, but because of the biobanking. Um, uh, what you see in the personal testimonials is that people take for granted that um, the information that they get is a value for, for risk management. Um, they want that nar narrative, that story, however loose it may be and however many disclaimers there are, um, to be something that allows them to manage risk for the future. Um, I, on the previous slide, I have um, the BRCA mutation cases, and then we have late onset Alzheimer's disease. Sarah um, felt that she understood her own genetic risk much, much better from 23andMe. Um, and so she began um, and prepared to, to prepare to plan uh, for that eventuality for having Alzheimer's. And what I'll just sort of like signal from the beginning, and this will be somewhat out of text because I haven't presented any of my partial conclusions yet, but what I'll just suggest from the beginning is the perversity of this to a particular extent. My belief is that if we are going to create a better world uh, for supporting 
those with Alzheimer's. It's something we have to do together politically and socially. Um, Sarah, what can Sarah do? She can set aside an amount of money if she's lucky to pay for the care that she'll eventually need. But in all likelihood, what will happen is that money will be outstripped early on um, and that she will not be able to receive forever out of care. Um, and my concern is that um, in focusing here on risk assessment being and risk management being something an individual does, we lose sight of some of those basics. Um, we also get uh, the genetic responsibility coming in coming in the clinic and stemming from the clinic. Um, so I've often written about, in my previous book, I wrote about this piece called Procreative Benefits, written by a bioethicist named Julian Sabalescu. Um, and I've written quite a bit about it, actually, in other places, too. I kind of always try to give him hell. Um, and what he says is that we need to select the best child with the best life possible when we have the opportunity to, when we're engaging in reproduction. And I'm highly critical of this. Um, for a lot of reasons, uh, but not only because we can't predict who has the best life, um, we don't know what traits will be of value in the future, but it also just relies on a sort of genetic determinism that we know is false um, about human beings. Um, also, uh, we get, I have a lot of other examples here. Um, you have uh, claims in bioethics papers that in order to combat climate change, we could maybe engineer ourselves to be smaller so that we eat less, so our carbon footprints are less. Um, and so that would mitigate what they refer to as the essential risk of climate change by turning to the human body. Um, Jamie Allberg, uh, who's over at UF, a uh, really wonderful person to work with, um, and I've presented with her on panels before. She commented on my book. We have a lot of good exchanges. Um, I deeply disagree with her in this case. Uh, what she claims is that if you have the choice and you select um, a child who has needs, uh, when you're reproducing. Um, and so we're thinking about IVF now, um, co combined uh, screening practices. Um, you have the choice and you select a child with needs, then you should be responsible for their uh, additional educational costs. Um, and again, I'm going to say that this is misplaced individualized responsibility. Um, and uh, I'll just mention really quickly the um, fifth example. Um, well, the fourth example, I'll say just one thing. Um, our uh, ability to see variation using chromosomal microarray and massively parallel sequencing outstrips our understanding of what that variation means. Um, so we may do genetic counseling in which we say, well, you know, here's some information about how your gene or how your potential child's uh, genetic um, uh, information looks, and there's variation. Uh, we're, we don't have uh, in most well, in very many cases, a sense of what that means. Um, and then with CRISPR, the the um, construction of risk there is that we can cut paste and, and engage. And um, it's become very clear recently uh, through a couple examples that this is um, difficult territory. Some of the most recent engagements in which folks are using CRISPR to alter the gene the, the genes of someone have resulted actually in the destruction of entire chromosomes. Um, and I'll say more about that. So I'm interested from all these different sites of risk in saying a couple things that are very sort of French philosophy and that are not always going to be, I think, um, something that people are ready to, to agree to. But I think it's, I have a lot of evidence that they're true. Um, so risk is constructed or political all the way down. Um, I'll reference here the idea from disability theory, Susan Wendell, back in the 90s. Um, you can become disabled because of political decisions, right? Over policing, under policing, um, sending folks to war. Um, even if you want to say, well, some bodies are just disabled or some people are hurting. My question is, how did that sort of happen? I believe that we can talk about risk um, as social and political in essentially every case I've discovered um, in a meaningful, helpful, illuminating way. Um, so I want to sort of overturn the idea of objective risk factors. Um, and I also want to say that as a word, that risk isn't inert. So following off of um, Ernest, Ernest LeClau and some other political theorists, I'm working with the concept of the floating signifier, where the word risk can attach to particular people, particular pop populations, and be fundamentally transformed. Risk isn't just a word that we all know the definition of. 
Um, and again, uh, when I start talking about floating signifiers to folks outside my discipline, they're going to think that maybe I'm not going to be very helpful on this topic after all. Um, but my claim is, you know, essentially that, well, okay, let's talk about where we can define risk and what the fundamental object of risk is. And I claim there isn't one, um, that it floats. Uh, and then finally, uh, risk management, and this is where I do need to shift my language a little bit. Increase the severity of risk might make it seem like there is objective risk again. Um, I want to say that risk management discourses marginalize people and can increase harms um, instead of helping. And one good example of this that I've often used when I've talked to people in a casual setting about my project is the hardening of schools. Um, so bringing um, uh, cops or bringing um, law enforcement into a school um, is engaged as like an idea to increase or help the safety, um, but that drives then the school to prison pipeline, which then marginalizes folks. So a risk management move within the discourse of making a school safer um, can actually increase harm. Um, and in this case, we have tons of data about the school to prison pipeline. Um, so enter my favorite, um, Michelle. Uh, what I am going to be doing always in my work is thinking through his three fundamental moral challenges. Um, folks like to say that Michel Foucault does not have an ethical theory because he's so deeply political, but these are actually the pieces of his ethical theory that he articulated in an interview. Um, and uh, actually, the interview was published in 1988, I should say, but it wasn't given in 1988. He um, died in 1984. So I believe this the initial interview was, I think, in like 1982, but I'm not positive. Um, and he says that we should refuse the status quo, so not take for granted anything that's handed us in terms of discourse. Um, we should engage in creativity and innovation. So what that means to me is looking for alternatives. So what I want to do in my book is look for alternative ways of thinking about risk that do not do what I said on the last slide is my worry, that risk management currently marginalizes and increases harm. So I want to look for alternatives to talking about risk that don't do that. Um, so I don't um, think that I have very much time so I'm just going to say a couple of my big picture things so that you can see the shape of my project on the positive side. Um, first of all, Foucault tells us that subjectivity is constructed. So people are made, not discovered. And some of his key questions have been of big value to me as I look at the settings of risk. So how are we constituted as moral subjects of our own actions that is made responsible? How are we constituted as subjects who exercise or submit to power and as subjects of our own knowledge, like in the case of 23andMe? So there are all kinds of interesting subjects of risk, venture capitalists, the at-risk student, vulnerable populations. Um, I've been working on this project, it feels like, for five years. And I guess I'm close to that of trying to articulate what the various subjects of risk are. But here's the most important piece that I really want to get I stop. And I know I always have so much more that I want to say. Um, and I'm happy to see, like, if people have questions, then maybe I can go to some of my slides. And if not, maybe I can say a little bit more. Um, but the most important thing that I want to analogize is with regard to prisons. So Foucault has this concept of the productive failure. He essentially uses prison to engage this. Um, and what he says here is essentially um, prisons are known to be failures. Um, they, but they last. Why? He actually thinks that they do sort of do something else. They don't do their purported task, um, but they do, uh, they do something else. Um, so what roles do they serve? And some of you may be aware that, of course, he says that they make people docile. Um, so prisons create docile citizens um, or warehouse or things like that um, in a call to the new Jim Crow um, book, which came out um, and discussed the warehousing of excess populations, um, Michelle Alexander. Um, so much of his later work is using this idea of a productive failure. Prisons fail, but they do do something that people are find valuable. Um, and what that is, is what he's interested in. And so when I think about risk management as a discourse, um, what's the productive failure there? Individualize, produce, and direct risk. That's my answer. And responsibility for risk. 
That's my answer. Our risk management discourses makes it seem like the way to handle risk is all by yourself. You do it, okay? And so I have a ton of examples of this, and the way that this looks on my own computer is more fun because you can click through and see like multiple um, examples. Uh, but um, there are all kinds of things that you get um, about how the power is in your hands. Don't get bitten by a mosquito. Um, you know, don't uh, Prop 65, like every public building in California, as Rebecca Cook philosopher over at Georgetown says is marked with this. What are you supposed to do? Um, they're not actionable all the time, but they do tell you that um, you're responsible for risk management. Um, so uh, public health risk communications might fail to mitigate risk, and we know they do. I mean, it's just a fact. If you look at the various arenas, um, and COVID is a great example, uh, we're not necessarily mitigating risk, but we do effectively distribute responsibility for risk, and I want this to be interrupted. So I'm going to skip ahead um, to like how this could, how can we think about it differently? And there are a lot of details here from Martin Heidegger and disability theory. Um, but what does it look to have collective responsibility for risk instead? Well, when it comes to Zika, I know I can't stop myself from getting bitten by a mosquito. Not really. I can do a lot of, things, but I can't do that. Um, but if we focus on environmental policies like wetland management, that can reduce the number of viral vectors. When you look at economic policies, think about COVID. Why do minorities get and die of COVID at much higher rates? It's not because of their bodies. It's not because of biological risk factors. It isn't. It's because they have to keep working on average. They are so-called essential workers because they live in crowded arenas. So our policies that create and exacerbate policies need, or poverty needs to be reversed. Um, we can still talk about individual behaviors. This is still important. But it's not merely, you shouldn't merely focus on individual behaviors. Um, and so when you look at COVID, um, it's, a, it's a possibility for big collapse projects. It's a big, scary, horrible, devastating situation. But the way that that risk looks for us can be moved about if we work on it together, and I argue not if we work on it alone. So um, there's just all this interesting discursive stuff emerging. Love your neighbor, wear a face mask. We all know that um, these early stories about, oh, I'm really wealthy, but I depend on such and such person to work in my home, so now what do I do? Um, there's this thing which if we're all in the position to be able to protect ourselves, then none of us are. There's that deep connection. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity here for us to say, like, okay, got to talk about what collective responsibility for risk looks like. Um, so my final argument in my book is going to be that we need strong models of collective responsibility. And I'm going to provide examples. Um, so like we could have public trust biobanking, um, thinking about like innovative uh, ways of dealing with COVID. I definitely think that um, uh, <laughs> being able to have a steady job, a basic universal basic income doesn't necessarily sound like a public health intervention, but I argue that it is. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I, I've been and where I'm going. And again, there are a lot of other details I'm happy to share, but I'm just thrilled to be like telling you about this project right now. And I'm excited about potentially receiving some questions now. Um, and if not, that's okay too. I could um, talk about a couple more things or end the session early, but I'm happy to hear from anyone if they have questions now. Yes, Harry. Melinda, Melinda that was really um, intense. And I mean, <laughs> all right, there was a lot to unpack there. Uh, so I have to uh, leave in a few minutes, but I want to just ask you a question as a novice, as an outsider. Yeah. Okay. So from a, from a, perspective of a philosopher, right? Yeah. And you're in a totally different realm, okay? And this notion, it's very interesting, you know, you're, what you were talking about, uh, the context of risk. Mm -hmm. And can you help me understand this connection potentially between the decisions that we make, right? Because from a from a lay 
layperson's perspective, risk to me, me, there are two types of risk, right? Mm -hmm. There's a risk that you don't know about. Yeah. You find yourself in an environment, you don't know that there's risk associated with it potentially until it's too late, and then yep. it's too late. But from the context of the environment in which you are informed, mm -hmm. whether because of your position or your training or what have you, you know that there's risk. So at some point, how does personal choice, because that's a big philosophical point thing too, right? Personal choice play into the decision process that leads an individual to do something like the 23andMe or do something like decide not to wear a mask, do something like, you know, make a decision that might be counter to what the majority or another another segment of the population is, you know, uh, the decisions that other other segment of the population is making. Mm -hmm. um, can you help me? Can you bring that to earth for me if I'm making any sense? I, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's been too much focus on personal choice and too little about big collective pool projects like wetlands management, for instance, for um, mosquito uh, viral uh, mosquito borne um, viral illnesses here um, in Florida. That's an example that I think is like kind of down to earth. But I want to talk a little bit about hurricanes for a second. So let's think about that. Um, for me as a philosopher, there's fundamental chance in our lives. We're fundamentally vulnerable. Um, I say that, you know, we, <laughs> the basic thing is, hey, we're mortal. There's going to be like what most people think about, about risk. Um, there's going to be that no matter what, like, which is to me, like a sort of chance, or something you can't predict. So like, do we know how many hurricanes we'll get next year? No. You want to call that risk? That could work. Um, that's interesting. Uh, it's, I think of it as a sort of unpredictability. So insofar as risk management discourses try to make everything predictable, it's kind of antithetical really to the way most people talk about risk because um, you can't do that management. Um, but with regard to like any hurricane, think about like individual action you might do. Um, you might put like really fabulous um, covers on your windows. You might buy like a state of the art roof. Uh, you might engage in construction in your private residence that um, keeps you more protected, uh, put in a generator, things like that. Um, but what are some of the truths, the larger truths about hurricanes, major tropical storms, and so on? Well, your construction is only as good as your neighbors. The infrastructure that we have is a shared thing. And climate change drives really hyper intense weather patterns. My argument is essentially that we shouldn't sort of like manage the risks of hurricanes on our own. We should do it together. That's one claim. Whether or not somebody makes a personal choice definitely can open themselves up to harm. People can definitely open themselves up to harm. I don't want to suggest something like, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter if you wear a mask or not. Um, I do think it matters if you wear a mask. Um, but you know what really matters? is stuff like where whether or not we have health care in the first place. A lot of folks talked about Trump and his um, contraction of COVID um, and the fact that he got incredible care. Um, you know, there is a deep impact in the level of risk that something like COVID presents. You don't have coordinated action or you don't have basic health care or a basic income to carry you through times of unemployment. So what I am trying to get at is it is very convenient for the status quo that is like a hyper individualistic culture in which capitalism and innovative uh, venture capitalists are like the name of the game. It's very convenient to them. People think that it's all up to you as an individual and I'm just going to buy, you know, sort of the right things and things like that. Um, and if I don't if I'm not protected, it's going to be because I failed, because I didn't buy the right roof, because I didn't do this, because I didn't do that. It's much less convenient for the status quo, much more radical if we say something like, no, 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 there are projects we can do together. And those projects might fail, 
So this is where my sense that like of the title of my thing, uh, risking ourselves together comes from. Um, let, we can read risk in collective project more so. We get, whenever we engage in something together, it always involves what Martin Heidegger, on my view, it always involves what Heidegger calls care, which is a kind of engagement with, which opens itself up to its opposites. We can always screw up, right, when we try to build something together. We have a whole new series of like potential fails there. Um, but we can recenter stuff on things that we do together, risking ourselves together, the built environment, public policies, and away from individual choices. And I think that's going to be better. And I think I have a lot of evidence for why better. Um, COVID is an emerging situation, but you see evidence there too already. That what really is going to matter is the stuff we decide on together. Does that? I don't know if that really answers your question about bringing it down to earth. I mean, I'm thinking, well, I'm trying to. That, that did, um, because, you know, I don't, I like others, don't think it that this is a different level, different granularity of thinking. Right? Yeah. And different arena, yeah. I think it's 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 really quite interesting. Um, Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that, and I, I love your question. You know, and I yeah. I'm sorry. I can see a little more clearly now um, why you why you um, follow in this instance or apply a full call. Yeah. Yeah. Or, because the way that we are talking matters to what we actually do, which then matters to how much harm we perpetuate potentially. And so risk as uh, you're taking it into a collective. Yeah. Instead of, that's interesting. I'll, I'll just say one other thing and I'll be done. Um, you, when you showed the CRISPR, I just yeah. want to say that if you're ever, I would like to, um, it out there if you are ever teaching a JSON or anything and you talk about um, risks associated with things like biotech and bioethics I I will um, be more than happy to um, contribute to a conversation about CRISPR I would um, love that I would love that I personally from a scientific perspective uh, I think it's remarkable you know I was on the scene when PCR started and all this kind of thing and I've watched it evolve over the years, but yeah. from a philosophical perspective, what scares me about CRISPR is I don't believe that human society, I don't believe we're mature enough to have that type, but we've developed it. So Pandora's out. And I yeah. always think about, I was talking to my daughter about the brave new world, you know, all this Huxley's brave new world. And, you know, it's not that um, crazy because that's yeah. the whole idea in terms of the application, you know, forced evolution. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would I would love that, Harry, because I, you know, obviously I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on the science side and I'm just kind of watching from the sidelines. It's so fascinating to me on so many levels. A lot of disability activists have from the beginning expressed concerns about the applications of CRISPR and they feel that they're not being heard. Um, so it's been like, you know, for me, like watching the exchanges, uh, a woman named Alice Wong, who was an advisor for Barack Obama for a little while. She does this thing called the Disability Visibility Project. She's written some great stuff recently on CRISPR. Um, and, you know, but I don't always have the context for that. And I'm just trying to, like, understand it philosophically. Right. Um, so, yeah, I would I would adore that. Thank you, Harry. Um, Noel, you had your hand up a moment ago, but maybe you took it down. Nope, I, uh, I think well done, and I was just trying to analyze whether or not y'all were talking about, you know, my new air fryer when you're talking about CRISPR or not. <laughs> you want, um, well, Harry, do you want to tell Noel what, no, so it's like a way of cutting, yeah. No, I, do, I do know what it is. Oh, do you know? Okay, I was, <laughs> I, I was just saying a joke. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like your I, joke. <laughs> I, I, do, I do think this is, this is, this is very interesting, Melinda, and was listen, was trying to hear the number of times you used the words objective versus either subjective or emotional yeah. or you know those kind of things and so in yeah. in response to harry you use the word truths which is the yeah. more objective side and i think that when you were talking about actuarial thinking that's more on the mm -hmm. objective side and then yep. when we get into things like you know whether or not somebody who i don't know can use a sidewalk 
as a yeah. weapon against me, that that's more on on perception. So risk, in, in my mind, is a, is a great balance between um, the objective things that you know and your perceptions, some of which you have control over and some of which you don't. And when I extend, extend that thinking to, to the collective versus the individual, I'm inclined to think that the objective aspect of risk management is much more likely in the collective, in the actuary, mm. as a business practice to do that. Ah. And I'm wondering if, if the, you know, suggesting that a move toward more community oriented risk management is an effort to, to make something more objective than based in the perception of one's, you know, individual, mm. and whatever an individual is bringing. Certainly in, in COVID, um, yeah. I think we've seen We've seen the perception of risk carry a, a high cost. Yeah. And uh, in, in my work at the university for the last eight months, you know, I see a very, a very stark difference between the perception of risk and then the way in which we've tried to make decisions based on objective risk decisions. So I'm curious if any of that, the, the, the schism between objectivity and perception as mm -hmm. it, as it comes into risk management as part of your work or part of yeah. your inclination to move toward a more community engaged model? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is one reason I love giving talks like this. I think that's such a fabulous question and it makes me realize that I've overlooked like a very important element here. I think that like, so when I think about the difference between subjective and objective, one of my thoughts is about big capital T transcultural truth versus little uh, lowercase t material truths. So like, for example, um, in philosophy, we talk about like a correspondence theory of truth, meaning that you have a word, uh, a sign, and it always points to a steady state signified element. Like, for instance, truth is usually in philosophy, the capital T kind, reserved for sentences that you speak or say or write or whatever that adequately slash accurately point to actual objects or something like that. So the, the, what, the word, or what the words are that you have the signifier and then the signified. Um, so where they connect or they have a leash between the two of them, then that's truth. And so there's a kind of linguistic truth there or something. And so when I talked about objective truth in this presentation, what I was thinking about was the idea that there is literally such such a thing as having a risk that's like stable or steady state that can be like pointed to reliably. Um, so somebody might say um, about me. Uh, so I had genetic testing done when I was pregnant, um, and then a ten uh, serum that was a serological test done uh, after I was pregnant. Uh, after I became pregnant um, and somebody might say, well, you have such and such risk of like, you know, having a child with such and such impacts in their life. Um, that sort of thing I take to be highly discursive and mediated by a lot of different disciplines, genetic discipline, um, communication disciplines, um, medical uh, general practitioners, uh, articulation, and then understandings about the quality of life after birth. Right. So I do think that most of my work can be described in the way that you said as being concerned about prejudice, bias, subjective understandings that harm people. And I do think that we can do it better. And that part of doing it better is becoming more collective. But what I've never really thought about is this irony in my account that you pointed out that maybe what I'm hoping for as a collective is like better understandings of risk, which means that I think that risk, there is something that we have to uncover that's better, you know, a better account, something that more adequately leashes to the world, world itself, and we're not doing it right now. So I really appreciate your comments so much, and I may have just gone off on an enormous tangent that you that did not meet you where you were, but I'm thinking about that and I really appreciate it. Oh, I love that response. Thanks. Uh, I think yeah. that there's, uh, there's a lot here. There's a lot, it feels like the kind of thing that we're talking about right now is yeah. the balance that we try to strike 
with virtually every decision that we're making nowadays, right? In this hyper yeah. environment uh, where everybody's assessing the risk that they're in with, with every oh. move. Constantly. And the thing that I hear most from people when I talk it through is that, oh, what? there's no answer, though. Like, I, you know, there's risk here, there's risk there. And I just think, yep, 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 that's right. It's it's a tremendously complicated situation. Um, but, you know, when I think about the work of the Safer uh, Steps in Task Force and the work that they've done, you know, I do think it's been incredible. We're kind of a city unto ourselves at Stetson. And so what I like to think is how can we, you know, have that kind of coordinated collective action on a larger scale? And some of our, because we have such an individualistic culture, it's not as possible, you know? So I kind of see us as doing this work, like, oh, wow, we can do this because we're a community, you know? I, um, but I, anyway, I, yeah. I think that's right, yeah. And, and yeah. we have a choice, right? As a, yeah. as a higher education institution, we may be more inclined to the, the community approach than a, a regular business would be. But still, we had a choice. And yeah. at least my perception is that we've done a, a, a reasonable job of embracing yeah. uh, the community's input on the risk that we are that we are a, a accepting to make sure that our business remains viable. But that viable. balance is something um, that that's that's tough. Um, is your perception yeah. that we as an institution have have done but maybe better than most in terms oh, of yeah. seeking that balance? Yes, absolutely it is. Um, and I think that one of the things that I would point to that's interesting from the perspective of my project is the fact that we are engaged in a collective risk mitigation project. And that collective risk mitigation project is online learning. Hmm. And it has its own potentials for failure and its own patterns of care. Yeah. But we're doing it together as a risk mitigation strategy, and it's worked because there aren't very many of us who are sick. So, yep, I, I think that we have done well. I mean, I don't I don't know how to speak to, like, the business implications necessarily long term. I think that's, you know, slightly different from what I've been focusing on in my book because I'm not engaged in economics that much. Um, I'm mostly looking at, like, you know, the human uh, activities, behaviors almost, or, you know, talking about behaviors. Um, but I think that on the online learning side, it's a really solid example of a collective project that we all decided to engage in together and that is um, a new way or an alternative way of thinking about risk. And then we might say something like, oh, my gosh, I'm at risk of my class dropping off the planet when my Wi-Fi goes out. OK, no, that's new. <laughs> that's like a new alternative. Right. I, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're doing quite well, honestly. Um, I'm terrified about everything always. But, I, you know, that's me. That's me. That's where I am with. Uh, my anxiety, you know, and, and COVID, it's hard, uh, but uh, we're, I think we're doing quite well. I think that's everybody now. I think yeah. everybody is terrified of everything, and it's a matter of whether or not people show it or say it. Yeah. But, the, yeah. but yeah. It's, all, it's almost objective that everybody is like. <laughs> yeah, it's close to objective. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I really go. appreciate your questions, and um, I see that we, uh, Harry has left, and Elizabeth leave early, earlier, so I just thank uh, Thank you, Noel, for, for that. And thank you, Chris. Um, and again, you know, happy Veterans Day to you. Um, and yeah, thank, thanks so much. This was really fun. Thank you. Very good, everybody. Thanks. Okay.